I'm going to begin with a little prelude um, because what I'm going to talk about involves two very difficult and um, in many ways contentious, unresolved uh, ideas, and they are about spirit and matter. So, a little prelude. Now, God surely exists in many minds as a belief. That's an empirical fact. Uh, and people would say, well, he exists as a spirit. You're not going to find God uh, sitting next to you in a chair, except maybe in your mental representations. So God exists as a spirit, fine. But it's also true that sun and clouds, trees and mountains, larks and lions, and any other kind of thing that you can think of that is physical, they do not need a mind in which to exist. But God needs a mind in which to exist. You won't find God without a mind in which to hold him or her. That's a very interesting thing. There's a very strong relationship between our ability to conceive of God and the fact that we have a mind. Um, and God surely exists in many minds as a belief, a spirit, but it's not without major impacts on human societies. Uh, I have a friend who thinks, he's an atheist, and he thinks that he can't understand why people believe all this kind of Looney Tunes stuff about resurrections and such. And he has very little appreciation for how powerful these beliefs are. There are major impacts on societies from the belief that people hold in their heads about God. Uh, for example, this is a Easter Sunday in uh, St. Peter's Square in Rome, where Catholics are gathered. And this is a powerful coming together. It stems from the belief that people are holding in their minds. And this is the Kaaba in Saudi Arabia, and it's circled by thousands and thousands of Muslim pilgrims, they are not on the same page as those Catholics, but they have a similar ritual. And that idea, that sense of God that they have in their minds makes this possible. So it's clear that God exists as a psychological concept, if you will, or a kind of psychological reality a very powerful force in human consciousness and has done so for centuries, if not millennia. Now, one can ask, does God exist beyond minds and the collective consciousness of human culture? All the minds together with their temples and churches and of course, books, holy books, that is a very big reservoir, a reality that holds the belief in God. So there's reality. The reality is what people do with what they have in their heads, and not just in their heads, but as I mentioned, in the culture as a whole, in books and so on, and temples, and all the reminders, sacred art, just all kinds of places where God is evoked in the culture. Now, it wasn't true, say, uh, 50,000 years ago, when there weren't any such things. There was only the speech of people and perhaps their artifacts, some hunting weapons, and maybe some simple tools. And probably, probably at that time, people were wearing clothing of a certain kind. 
That's it. There weren't any temples. There weren't any holy books. But there was speech. So people chanted and sang and also danced and painted themselves and costumed themselves. And that was a mechanism for transmitting this idea of their god, usually a, a tribal god. And the tribal gods were not all the same. And in many of, uh, as is true even in modern religions, the tribal gods are in conflict with one another. They're often fighting one another. So the question that I have up there on the slide is, does God exist beyond that? Now, you could argue to devout believers that, look, for, for, there's something really powerful and remarkable about the ability of the mind to have God living in it. Um, this is incredibly remarkable, and it's powerful. It has important effects. Uh, but that's it. That's where God is. You don't find God, uh, he's in heaven to the extent that you can believe him in heaven in your mind, but he's not any place that you can point out. You can't physically apprehend him. And of course, people are skilled enough to know that you, you wouldn't claim that God is uh, existing in, anywhere, in, in any place except in mythic dimensions. So that, for example, Jesus is God, but you don't find Jesus. There's very little evidence to know where Jesus is or where he was. In fact, it's important that when God appears in physical form, it's not really physically observable. That is, you couldn't do physics experiments to just check out if this was God. That's very important. Um, now, most people, most devout people, would not find that satisfactory. It's not enough that God exists in the collective culture of a mind. And it's made more difficult by the fact that there are different gods in different minds. The atheists, on the other hand, are not happy about that at all because they, they would just assume God didn't exist in the mind either. Um, I'm going to try to make a little bit of progress on having some respect for and some awareness of a universe which needs more than a God in the mind to explain some of its deep and most precious aspects to us. So that's where I'm headed. Are you saying you're headed to explaining that there is a God that exists not in the mind? Yes, that's what, that's what I'm saying. Does, is there a God that doesn't exist in the mind? We certainly know that God exists in the mind. It's, more, it's important to say not just your mind or some minds, but lots of minds and lots of things beyond minds, like sacred books. It's, it's a big deal, this whole structure that holds the idea of God. And it's amazing, and it's an important achievement. Well, to the extent that we call human things achievements, because we also achieve war and lots of other things that aren't so nice. I don't mean to say that religion is not nice. It's definitely got important things that bind people together and control their behavior in, in beneficent ways. But I'm trying to step beyond a purely psychological explanation of what we would mean by the mystery of our existence. and. That's where I'm headed. So the first thing I'm going to do is try to give you an understanding of the meaning of the word spirit in a quantum world. Now, Aristotle um, was one of the first people who noticed that 
natural objects seem to consist of two things. He thought, well, first of all, it's made of stuff. It's made of matter. You can hit it and it resists you. You can, it, it's material. But how do you explain all the different kinds of matter there are? Does the matter just change form? And he was thinking a little more like the plasticity of clay. So if I have a big lump of clay, that's kind of the idea of this, what he called prime matter. But then you could make the clay into other shapes. And this uh, little sculpture here of Aristotle is a kind of example of that. Imagine that's made out of clay. So the artist takes the clay, which was just an amorphous blob, and then he makes this figure. Um, now you can say, well, it's just a blo blob of clay. Well, no, it's not. It's got more to it than that. The artist has put some information into it. The information is a, his likeness, some kind of representation of a man who he claims is Aristotle. And that clay is not the same as the blob of clay that lay on the table before he made it. So Aristotle was trying to explain what's going on, but then he was more deeply thinking of, well, we have water, and it exists typically as liquid, but then it can be frozen into ice, and it can also be boiled away as steam. All those things seem to be water, but the form has changed. So what Aristotle called prime matter is, is what we in modern terms would say H2O. And what he called its substantial form is what in modern terms we would say the phase it was in. It's in the solid phase, or it's in the liquid phase, or it's in the gas phase, but it's water. Um, so, The form is kind of spiritual stuff in the sense that it is encoded in the matter. The figure of Aristotle is imprinted in the matter, but it's not the matter. The matter is clay. Now, the scholastics took the idea and, and really worked on it in this typical scholastic philosophies full of primal causes and final causes. And it's just a tangle of words and uh, trying to make sense of this prime matter and uh, substantial form. And finally, Descartes in, this, in the late 16th and 17th century, he said, Forget it. The Aristotelian form is unnecessary. Matter operates in an entirely material way. It doesn't have anything to do with this kind of spiritual form idea. Now I want to tell you about the discovery of the quantum nature of matter, which uh, casts this in a kind of more interesting light. Uh, it says, not so fast, Descartes. Uh, there's something a little more to this. Here's what it is. So let me introduce this, first of all, by talking about Aristotelian form and prime matter in modern computers. These are memory registers. You have these on your computer, and they contain the memory banks of your computer. So if you're writing a letter, the text that you're writing is going into those memory banks where it's stored. The memory banks are made of silicon and uh, other metals, electronic components. Now, the registers that are storing your letter as you type are not the letter. But on the other hand, you wouldn't say that the letter when it's in the memory registers, is the memory register because it could be stored someplace else. For example, you could handwrite it out 
and then it would be ink on paper instead of electrons in a memory chip. So here's an Aristotelian form and matter in modern computers. The silicon transistor chip is the memory register. It's the material part. The contents of the memory, how the switches are set to indicate which letter is stored there, that's the immaterial or spirit part. Now, when I use the word spirit here, I'm being pretty restrictive. That's why I'm always putting it in quotes, because that word spirit is uh, spread so far across our intellectual landscape, uh, people mean all kinds of things by it. I'm going to be pretty strict about it. I want to use it because I want something a little more than just contents of a memory register, something a little more than immaterial. So that's why I'm using spirit with quotes. But I do not mean it in any kind of fantastic way. So quantum matter, like that computer memory register, it has a material part, which is the mass energy of particles. So if you have a particle, it's got a mass and an energy. In the case of photon, all it has is energy. It doesn't have mass. But, so the, that's, and mass and energy, since Einstein, are interconvertible, same thing. So the material part's the mass energy. That's what, if, if you kick the rock and stub your foot, that's what you're, you're doing. You're hitting that rock. But it's got an immaterial part, which wasn't known until the dawn of the quantum era, which is the wave function. So this, isn't, this is just a kind of artist's idea. Uh, the particle is the mass energy is, is being displayed here, and the wave surrounds it. In fact, the waves of quantum particles are three-dimensional waves in space, and they spread out, and there's no simple place that you can say, well, here's the particle where the mass resides. It's, when you measure it, you will measure some mass, but it's very hard to localize it. It's hard to localize it precisely, but it's obviously like in one of the hydrogen atoms, electrons, it's localized in pretty much where the probability density of that electron is highest, someplace on its orbit going around the nucleus. So the mass energy of the particles is the material part. The quantum wave function is the immaterial, or quote, spirit, unquote, part. And the quantum wave function is pure information. Now, what is the information? It's, it's a text. It's more than a text. It's one of these primitive notions that you can't define in terms of something else. You have to work with it for a bit. But it's basically that which tells the particle, whether it's an atom or a molecule or whatever, what to be and where to go. So if you just have atoms arbitrarily laying around, the what to be they have is arbitrarily lay around. But if they're put together in a molecule of some kind, then the what to be are the, is contained in the information that tells where the bonds are in that structure. The atoms are atoms. And if you don't put, to put that together with the wave function, which says which atom is bound to which atom, you don't have a molecule. So the wave function tells what to be and where to go, and the mass energy is the material part in which the wave function information is encoded. In the same way, the artist encoded an image of Aristotle into a lump of cl clay. Not in the same way. Informationally wise, yes, that's the same way. Now I want to give you an example. Uh, 
I want to show you how this works for a typical molecule. And it's a kind of a big molecule. This is what's called a lipid molecule, and it's important in life. Uh, it has, it's only made of five different atoms. It has a couple hundred atoms in it, and each one of these lipid molecules can attach and lay side by side with others, and it'll form a capsule. It's very important in living organisms. That's how we have compartments in life. They're made of lipid molecules. Okay, so fine. Here's the matter. Here's the Aristotelian prime matter, if you like. Uh, it's got a bunch of uh, mostly carbon and hydrogen atoms, and, and then it's got a phosphorus atom, which is where this little uh, junction is that binds these two tails together. And then it's got a, a little head, and there's some nitrogen in that head. Here's the wave function. It tells you how these various components are strung together. It's like the recipe of how you would make this molecule if you wanted to make one. You have to follow that recipe. And you see that different components of this make subunits. Like here's a phosphate subunit, and this is a choline subunit, and the different kinds of bond structures that you have are all in this encoded information. Now, the interesting thing about this is you can have a diagram like this, which we use to represent it, but nature actually writes, writes that code right into the molecule in the same way that the artist wrote the facsimile of Aristotle into the clay. Now, you could also have, I could have given you a set of instructions that said, um, the first little particle of clay is at this such and such a coordinate, and the next one is here, and then put an eyebrow over there, and push an indentation in here for the mouth, and fix this to make the chin. You could have had a long list of instructions, a little bit like this over here. But the other thing is, it's right in the production. It's right, it's matter already has it encoded in it. And that's what makes this molecule a lipid. It's not just a box of molecule of atoms. Now, you could imagine, I took all those atoms, take them all apart, throw them into a box. Well, you can't do that because they'd start reacting with each other. The phosphorus and the oxygen would start burning and the carbon and the oxygen would start burning. And so you really can't do it. It's just a thought experiment. And then you take all these atoms out of the box, put them together according to this wave function, and there you get a lipid molecule. So, to bring Aristotle back into modern terms, this, this, this wave function is the form, the Aristotelian form of that molecule. It is the information, the quantum information, that tells you where all those bonds are. Uh, or it's the one that the, the molecule itself is advertising, saying, I'm a lipid by having that bond structure. It's advertising itself. And I'm also going to say, in a certain sense, uh, it's the spirit of that molecule. So matter, in this case, is the molecule. It has the mass energy. And the spirit is how the molecule is put together from atoms. That's the wave function. So how do atoms and molecules get into their positions? How do they acquire their spirit to become a definite thing, say a lipid molecule? How do they do that? They do it through the force fields that are built into nature. Force fields bind and move particles because they attract and repel them. Now, there are four well-known force fields. There's some debate now about whether there's a fifth. But the four that are well-established, there's only four. It's not like there's thousands. The weakest one is gravity, and, and we certainly experience that. 
The next is electromagnetism, that's electricity. Now, all of life, virtually all of life, all of chemistry, all of biochemistry is held together by these electrical forces. Now, in, and these electrical forces work on the atoms and ions that are important inside living beings. Now, inside the atom, there's a nucleus, and there's a weak nuclear force inside that nucleus, and there's also a strong nuclear force. The weak nuclear force is responsible for things like uh, radioactive watches, which are, I don't think they're popular anymore, but they would glow in the dark. And the strong nuclear force, of course, is what makes uh, bombs. It, it's more important than that, but that's one of the things that people use it for. So, here's a picture of a fairly complicated molecule. You don't have to know what it is. It happens to be an RNA molecule, which is one of the molecules that's involved with DNA in life. And this is a stick and ball picture of what it looks like. It's got a few, it's got a few hundred atoms in it. And over here is a diagram that's modeling not every last detail, but the bulk of the important details in which each of the subunits, little molecular subunits, is represented by a ball, and then the forces that are hooking it to the UB subunits are shown as springs. Now, in nature, there are no springs like that. The forces have the remarkable feature, which completely flummoxed medievalists, that you could have a force go through space without any, anything seen pushing or pulling it. The force could be translated the way it is with the moon right now. The earth is pulling on the moon. As it, it might just as well have a cable. It doesn't need a cable because it's got gravity. The gravity is pulling the moon here. And it, it goes through empty space. This, this bothered the medievalists a lot, that you could have action over a distance with no physical medium. Now, it turns out that there are actually little particles called gravitons that are going back and forth between the two, just like photons go back and forth. But that's another story. So here, here is this molecule. Here you see all of the forces. Now, you can think of, if you, if you imagine those as springs, and you go in and push on it a little bit, it's going to push back at you, it's going to vibrate, it's going to do all kinds of stuff. And that's the nature of it. So the wave function is what directs those forces. The raw force itself, the power of the force, is part of that system of forces. But the force is undirected, except the wave function comes in. So just like the wave function shapes matter, the wave function shapes the force. It tells it where to push and where to pull. And here's the last illustration uh, that I wanted to mention. Uh, if you've been to some of my previous talks, I've used this before. This is, a, this is a, a molecule that's a little bit more complicated than a lipid. It's a motor, it's actually called a kinesin. It's a motor protein. And it has this capacity inside the cell to walk along this strand, which is built of microtubules, and it attaches itself to this cargo, this big cargo vessel, and that cargo vessel is made of lipids, which made that capsule, and inside that capsule are important things like neurotransmitters and other elements of nourishment that the body needs in different places. And this could be being transported into a nerve cell. It does it by the force field of electricity. You don't have to push it. You don't have to tell it where to go. The wave function tells it where to go. And it walks. And bear in mind, we're in deep inside this, a, a, a biological cell. Usually we start talking about life when you have cells. 
So there's no, there's no life below the cell level. That's an error. There's actually something more fundamental in life called dynamism, which is what this is about. It's about these forces under the direction of the wave function doing things, doing things that are intelligent. So the universe is alive in charged particles and these electrical forces attract. So I want to now talk about, well, I just want to finish off here. The traditional belief of what makes matter be and go is that God does it. Now, I don't want to pretend that there isn't something magnificent and mysterious and wonderful about this. But it's not like the potter molding clay in Jeremiah 18, which is a passage in the Bible, some of you might know it, in which the prophet Jeremiah goes down to a potter's uh, place and he sees him making pots. And he sees how he takes the clay and molds it and makes the pot. And he thinks that's how God makes things. That's how God made us. And if God doesn't like the way it's come out, like the potter, he smashes it and he makes something new. And that's the point Jeremiah was wanting to get to in this passage. So the quantum nature of matter tells us that matter, matter does it spontaneously with its force field. Now the force field is built into nature. And you could well speculate and think, well, where did that come from? There's no nice theory for that. Um, you just have to take it as an irreducible fact that we seem to have these four fundamental forces. But given them, they do a lot. So, force fields manifest themselves in attraction. Now, they also cause repulsion, too, but I'm going to lump them all together under attraction. Because it, 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 attraction, even in a more general sense, moving away and up above atoms and molecules to living things, and attraction is the, the um, historian of science, Giorgio de Santillana, used to say that attraction is a great mystery. And I think that's so. The attraction of these forces is a great mystery. So force fields manifest this attraction, which impels motion. So I want to give you an idea of how attraction works in the pre-quantum worldview, before quantum mechanics. So we have two objects. They don't necessarily have to be atoms or molecules, but two objects that do experience the, the force fields, do have an experience of one or more of the force fields. So what happens? Well, they're pulled to each other and they encounter one another. Now, if they have more energy than the energy that would be involved in binding them together as a molecule, might be attracted to each other and then attach and become bound. This is electrical, but it's, the magnetic force is deeply related to it. They're the same scale of strength. The magnetic force, the electrical force, all on the same level of strength compared to the nuclear forces. But this is an electrical force. I, I, actually, I haven't said what it is. I'm just trying to show you the nature of the encounter. It could be gravity. Could be two massive bodies being pulled together by gravity. So, and when in, in the encounter, what happens is they attract and then there's a kind of climax in which they, if they were billiard balls, they, they hit. That's the collision moment. And then they scatter. Uh, 
Now, if it was a chemical reaction, they would bind to each other and then the two would be bound together. So, in a classical interaction, it is like billiard balls. The result is just a rearrangement of previous information, which is, in the classical world, if you know the position and velocity of these two particles, the position and velocity of the resultant particle that you get from the collision is completely known. It's completely determined. It's, there's no freedom about it. So, I've just schematically said here that when you get the result of A and B encountering one another, the result is, well, C is like A plus B. It doesn't have any more information than A and B had, but the information is rearranged a little differently, just like billiard balls will scatter off a little differently, but everything they're going to do was already set by the two balls that you sent to each other originally. Now I want to talk about quantum interaction. Same situation, we've got attraction, it pulls the two quantum bodies together, and then there's an encounter. And you notice I've kind of been kind of nebulous about that encounter, because what happens in that encounter is that what is resulting has new information that wasn't present in A and B. And this is because of the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics. The previous information cannot control the collision. It's got some freedom in it. It's going to have some spontaneity in it. Now, it's not going to be totally spontane spontaneous. In fact, it's only in the deep, deep quantum limit that you see all of this quantum randomness. If the particles become more and more macroscopic, large, the quantum part gets smaller and smaller. The little, the little bits of new information that the quantum was putting in are too small to even be noticeable. So what happens, though, is that there's new creation here, new information that has been put in that collision. Now, this only happens in big ways for very microscopic particles. And, but you can think of this as something that's always present. For example, uh, you've probably been to amusement parks where you see bumper cars. And if you look at these bumper cars, then they weigh about 200, 300 pounds. So they're massive objects. They have, they have trillions and trillions and trillions of atoms in them. But these atoms are a little, are vibrating and they change the actual structure of that car just very slightly. And it's sufficient so that after, even though this is a very big object, after about less than a dozen collisions, that, that bumper car is not going to be where it would be if there weren't a quantum effect. So the quantum effect, it's, it's, it's very tiny. It's like a millimeter, but a millimeter is actually quite measurable. I don't know if anybody's ever done an experiment like this. I wouldn't recommend it. You need to do something a little more laboratory careful than this. So new information is constantly streaming in from the micro interactions of all these atoms and molecules. And of course, once, even though the origin of this uncertainty is microscopic, once it starts propagating upward into the large-scale world, it's, it's showing itself in large-scale random effects that you can't completely, you can't follow, you can't trace them back. It's very hard to follow them back, but that's where they originated. And once you've got large-scale random effects, if you don't know all the details, 
you can't predict what's going to happen, and that's pretty much of our situation. We can only predict for a little bit, say the weather, or even what we're going to do. Maybe pretty well in the next five minutes, you'll probably be here, but I don't know, maybe something will happen. You'll get a phone call and you have to take off or something. So that's life, but actually that's part of the richness of life, is that it's not mechanical. It's not just deterministic. Uh, so the quantum is a, is, a, is a real origin of new creation and spontaneity. So, for example, in human DNA, which is the double-stranded DNA here, each one of these uh, links has a, a pair of nucleotides, and each one of them basically codes a letter of the genetic code. So, there's three billion letters in this DNA strand, but in a single generation, from the time you were born, or maybe it's from the time the ova that you were born from was fertilized, you received the DNA of your two parents, which was blended together. And there you got a fresh copy. But as those molecules sat in your body, they had a few spontaneous transitions take place. They were unpredictable. And in fact, the number is about 60 new letters per generation. So that's, that's how, if, if that didn't happen, evolution wouldn't work. You need to have random variations that evolution can then work on to get something new and check it out and see if that's better than what was old. And you don't want too much, though. You don't want each generation to completely turn the DNA over then you don't have any stability. So the secret of life is small, little incremental changes, and otherwise things are very stable. So I'd like to, I'm going to spend some time now on this attract, encounter, create paradigm. It's kind of a major paradigm for the whole universe. Um, and what I've done here is look at a bunch of different interactions or scales of the universe, starting with the single atom, single atom, and then working up where even all the way to the known universe. And what is the new information, or what the information structure is, some of which could be new. And information is measured in bits. You could think of them like letters. A bit is one of the letters. So if you've got a lot of bits, you've got a, long, you've got a lot of information because there's a lot of words in this document. So an atom has two states, two bits in the ground state. Uh, a hemoglobin molecule is 10 to the fourth, that's 10,000. Human DNA is a billion. A bacterium is 10 to the 14th. Now, what that means is that it's 10 to the 14th means a one with 14 zeros. That's how many, how big it is. And then you can keep on going. Uh, and a human being is 10 to the 28 bits. Now, not all of that turns over on every interaction. In fact, when you get bigger and bigger assemblies of atoms and molecules, the fraction of the spontaneous part gets smaller and smaller. But it's nonetheless there. And that's really, in a way, the secret of what makes life, what makes the universe dynamic, what makes it more interesting than just a crystal or billiard balls bouncing off each other. So attract, encounter, and create. And you can think of that just in terms of human life, of human beings attract each other. Man and woman attract each other. They encounter, they create new life, 
This is a theme that's played up from the most microscopic level up to very big levels. So the forces hold, I want to show you something now about this business of attracting and encountering. So the forces hold and impel the matter. You saw that in this little cartoon of the RNA molecule. So what I really, what I want to now introduce and bring, bring forward here is that when you've got these forces, forces are pushing and pulling. They are putting a kind of necessity into nature. There's no escaping them. And that push and pull on the microscopic level is manifested on the macroscopic level. You can't control your life course. You can't control the aging of your body. We can't, uh, the dynamism of the universe, I sometimes think of it like, it's like a fire hose and it's on. There's no stopping it. It's like time. You can't stop it. You can try to control it to some extent, but this fire hose of life is running. It's, it's running all the time and pouring out. And what it's pouring out is a repeat of the old up to a certain point, but a little transformation that's making it new. So I'd like to now introduce Simone Weil. She was a French woman, lived in the 20th century, a really quite remarkable uh, philosopher. In a way, she was not necessarily a philosopher, although she wouldn't object to being called that. She was kind of her own person. Uh, and what Simone, one of the things that she emphasized was this idea of necessity. Now, she didn't know any quantum physics, or if she did, she never talked about it. Uh, I doubt she was very interested in it. But I think it's interesting the way her ideas do resonate with the quantum world, the dyna dynamism and spontaneity of that world that I'm trying to describe. And it's true often that people who can perceive things rather accurately on one level, if they're pretty accurate about it, they will be correct about something that might be happening at a much lower level that's causing this higher level thing. So that was a, this is a phrase that's very familiar from Simone, which is, nature is necessity. Um, and two other things that she said that I'm going to draw on here is that Necessity brings forth beauty. That beauty of this dynamic world, this fire hose that can't be turned off, one of the things that comes out of it is beauty, a universe that's beautiful, many things about it that are beautiful, and also affliction, some things that are afflicted, that are in some sense malformed, and in some cases, absolutely malevolent. Um, and I think she was very accurate to focus on the dynamism, on, on net necessity as a philosophical concept, which is rooted in those force fields of nature that cannot be stopped. They are on all the time. So if we go back to our attract, encounter, create paradigm, necessity in nature tells us that there's an attraction, there's encounter and creation, and what comes out of that creation can very often be something of beauty, but what can also come out of that creation is affliction, suffering, things that are not 
well, to use a, a very traditional philosophical word, good. Now, let me explain uh, why this might be. Why are beauty and affliction? Why can't you just have beauty and skip the affliction? Why do we have to have suffering at the same time we also have joy? Can't we just have the good things without these bad things? So here's what I'd like to share with you as a way of getting a grip on that. So we know that in evolution, nature throws up random variations in each attract, encounter, create interaction. <clears throat> so in life, there's an attraction, encounter, create, and out of that, because of the quantum aspect, comes some randomness. Now those randomly out outcomes might lead to some, to some beautiful effects, but they might also lead to some kinds of affliction. So this attract encounter is taking place throughout the levels from elementary particles to complex creatures. Some are beneficent, beautiful and some are adverse and afflicted. Now why can't you just have the good things and skip the bad things? What will be cannot be fully predicted before the creative act. That's in a way the nature of creation. If it could be, it wouldn't be creative. It'd be like billiard balls bouncing off one another. But once it comes into being, once it happens, then natural selection can work on it. So in life, now let me just go back and emphasize this. So affliction and beauty cannot be fully known before the creative act. You can't know ahead of time what's gonna be beneficial, what's gonna be deleterious, which, which, which is gonna be adverse. So in life, natural selection chooses the more fit, and the, generally that choice works out for the benefit of the whole organism. It's the better choice. It may not be so great for a little segment of the organism, but by and large for the whole thing, it should be the better choice. But it takes time to learn. Every time nature throws up a pile of variations, the evolutionary organism, the evolving organisms have to, to learn the new situation and respond to it. So natural selection filters the beneficent from the adverse for each epoch of evolutionary history, which means you have to live with the deleterious things that evolution throws up as well as the beneficent things. And Natural selection, it's not working to make everything deleterious. It's not working to make everything uh, less reproductively successful. It's not working to make things ugly. It's not working, it's, it's actually, if the variations are thrown up without any bias towards what ultimately might be good or might be bad, Natural selection is trying to choose, not the bad, it's trying to choose the good that would be most useful at that moment for this organism. So there's a bias in life towards being reproductively successful, being, having the well-being of the whole organism uh, as a goal. So it's not just a toss of the coin for bad and good. There, it's a toss of the coin for the possibilities, but natural selection is biased towards the welfare and the, and the yes, the well-being of the organism. It wants well-being. And when we get 
very bad evolutionary effects, they die out. Sometimes you have to live with them for a while before they die out. Um, the one that I think we're living with is a very difficult one, which is the evolution of warfare in human societies, which over most of the run was reproductively successful in that the ones that had the stronger weapons and the stronger forces generally did better. And they, of course, have bequeathed to us a way of thinking and an emotional system and not only, not only in some genetic predisposition, particularly in males, but a cultural predisposition that makes it very hard to stop doing something as crazy, just as insane, as this conflict of North Korea and the U.S. threatening each other right now. For any sensible person looking at it, you say, this is like a cancer that's raging and you can't control it. And that's not a bad analogy. Okay, so uh, that's a kind of simple model, a simple idea of why affliction seems to be present. Uh, also on the level of diseases, uh, sickle cell anemia is, you know, it's an affliction. And so is cystic fibrosis, an affliction. And there are numerous other diseases like that that are genetic diseases. But in the populations in which they arose, sickle cell anemia arose in equatorial regions where um, uh, malaria was highly prevalent. And sickle cell gives the blood cell some capacity to resist malaria. So it had a beneficent aspect. But if you don't have any malaria, because you had to pay the price of these malformed sickle cells, then it's not so good. And the same way with cystic fibrosis, which probably arose because our, our ancestors had to live sometimes in dusty or fire-laden, you know, there would be forest fires, there'd be dust storms. And cystic fibrosis is related to some machinery that uh, produces mucus and may have been beneficent, beneficial if you had to live in a really dusty environment. So now let me just have a quote here from Simone Weil. Why? Why affliction? Why beauty? Now, I've just tried to give you a little sketch of why they're there. But she had another take, which I think is also quite beautiful. She wrote, those capable of not only crying out why before the affliction and beauty of the universe, but also of listening will hear the answer. Silence is the answer. He who is capable not only of listening, but of loving, hears the silence as the word of God. And I've added to Simone's statement here the following. The silence of God, like the vacuum state of matter, is not empty. Both are the source out of which the universe comes into being and knows itself. The vacuum state of matter is the state that matter can have when all the energy is essentially zero. But it's not really zero because there are quantum fluctuations that, of particles and antiparticles that cancel each other out. So the vacuum is actually a sea a teeming with activity, but it's all balanced. So that every time there's a particle that's produced, the antiparticles produced cancels out. Uh, but in the early formation of the universe, the vacuum state was in a what's called a metastable equilibrium, so that it, the universe wanted to basically start blowing up 
but it couldn't because it was in, it was a little bit like um, water that wants to change into ice but can't get across the energy barrier so that if you uh, tap it, I don't know if you've ever done this experiment, maybe you did it in grammar school or something, but if you get some water and you get it cool, super cooled so that it's just a little bit above the freezing level but it hasn't turned into ice and you hit it, it'll all suddenly turn to ice. Uh, that's, the true, that's what's happening with the vacuum state of the early universe, just as an example. So vacuum states are not empty. So we could say that affliction is the condition under which we find our way to beauty. And life is about fostering and nourishing beauty's emergence from necessity. So what does it mean, the silence of God? And I say it's like the vacuum state of matter. It's not empty. What's in it? It's an invitation to all of nature to speak and to act and to bring forth the beauty of creation. The silence of God is a call to all of creation. The silence of God says that you as an individual creature are central to creation. It's the traditional idea of God is that God does all this and we just uh, receive the benefits of, in some sort of way. And no, the silence of God says that you are central to creation to bring forth beauty in whatever part of the universe in which you find yourself. Now you can't be in charge of the whole universe, no one is. But in whatever little corner, every little particle of the universe, each creature finds itself. The silence of God is a way of, of saying you're invited this is a call for you to lend in whatever way you can a bringing forth of the beauty of creation. And that's where I'm going to end.